Welcome back, everybody, to Raven Star's Witching Hour. I'm your host, Solaris Blue Raven, and I'm here with my very special guest, Dr. Richard Allen Miller. And before we get to questions in the chat, I had one question for you, Richard, for myself. Um, the chemtrails we were talking about, do so you think that they're using those? We we're talking about light beings and, and uh, aurora borealis and such. Do you think they're using the chemtrails to kill and destroy these types of things or and also to illuminate the skies, perhaps to detect what they would consider enemy alien craft? Are you there? Where'd you go? Are you muted? <laughs> Damn, where'd he go? He must be someplace. Hey, Richard, where are you? Blast. I had my mic you on. Possibly, you do that to me all the time, I swear. So did you hear my question? Yes, I did. I had my mic off, so I was started to oh, talk. Oh, okay. Hey, so sorry. I was going to say, you know, I have no idea about light beings and wars, space wars. Okay. And that's what veterans today would suggest where all our money's been going is into a space war. Well, I'm wondering I, about the chemtrails using the sky, I mean, literally illuminating the skies so they're able to detect these types of uh, light, light craft, enemy craft, what they would consider enemies. We wouldn't. Yeah, I don't know about that. I, I okay. you know, it's. I just want, it, oh, you I wanted to ask. Save of it, it probably would make a great uh, Hollywood. Story. Yeah, I just need to be a multi-billionaire. Yeah, send it to Hollywood, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right, well, let's get into a question here from the chat. Let's see here. I think I texted it over to you. It was from Cinda Lou, and yes. she wants to ask you about uh, what you think about Dr. Judy Wood's work. And I think you kind of briefly touched on it earlier. She also said I'm going to be meeting with her in late October, uh, March. She's That's going to be great. Be in Lebanon, Missouri, uh, at the USA Prepares Conference. I'm very excited to interface with her. I find her work exceptional, and she's a very brave lady. Mm -hmm. Considering, I think it was Clemson that excommunicated her because of her disclosures about 9-11 being a false flag. Mm -hmm. I think everybody should realize that 9-11 did not happen like you think it did, that the fire chief uh, has gone public. Uh, that was in the middle of it when these buildings were coming down and he was losing his brothers while they were trying to save lives, sure. saying that it was demolition. And the demolition that they were using is new technology. Sure. Because I, you know, with when, we, when I was working with SEAL, they would have taken us months to rig a single building to fall with the precision that they did. And that's with using thermite. And there is wood is suggesting that a new energy beam weapon had been used because of the building seven collateral damage that turned down into slag. And I'm going to say that you put these little fullerene nanofibers in reinforced steel and you can make them vaporize with no forensics. That okay, means, let me ask you something, Richard. Is that disintegration or vaporization? Vapor is vapor. Okay, okay. Not disintegration. Not disintegration. Okay. Vapor goes. You take and it creates a cold fusion plasma that is so hot that steel vaporizes. After Building Seven fell down, there is this film clip where they show this one steel girder that was over six hundred and seventeen feet high. And as it started to slowly fall, like free fall, it vaporized into vapor. You can see it happen. Mm -hmm. And that is not jet fuel. Mm -hmm. So how did that happen? How did that work? And why did they do it? And here's a worse question. The idea that the neutron bomb originally originated as a Mossad weapon means that while I don't think the Mossad were involved with 9-11, I absolutely know they knew about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's all kinds of things on the Internet about that. And I don't know why they did 9-11 other than as a way that they needed collateral damage as a way to frighten the American public into a terror, uh, a, uh, you know, terrorism bill through Congress. Yeah. And with that, that's how it all worked. A psychological war game. It was I mean, absolutely not hit with, a, with an aircraft. It was a missile. And notice what part of the Pentagon was destroyed had the records of accountability for budget spent. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's all 
And the problem is, is there's so many false flags, it's convoluted. And by the time you take one layer off and you expose the crime, there's another one. Certainly. My guess is there will be a Nuremberg. There will be an accountability, but it won't matter. Like kind of like Fukushima, the Yakuza have a 40 year program for cleanup. That means that when it doesn't work, the people that would have been accountable are no longer living anyway. So it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's obsolete at that point. You know, it's interesting. It is a psychological war game. So it, you know, it tells me that obviously it was a show of power with 9-11. So are we dealing with black technology programs? Because the only people that could be, be able to deploy something like that would have to be black technology. Well, there's breakaway technology. Like That's a rogue group, you think? Yeah, rogue groups. That's always, when I was at the Pentagon, there were wars going on in the Pentagon. I'm not talking, it wasn't like we're all working together. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a Pentagon against the world. It was, there was wars going on. And so you have rogue groups within all kinds of things. You watch Nikita and some of these other special things with MI6, and it's all rife with infrastructure and convoluted false flags. And worse, our reporting today, you know, the national news and things like that, is worse, actually, than it was during World War II with Nazi Germany. It is absolutely... and. The public is not getting it. Mm -mm. They're not waking up to realize. I mean, people already know that the Pentagon wasn't hit by an aircraft. Why was it hit by a missile? And trying to be sold to the public as an aircraft, another one that went out. And more importantly, what happened to the people on that aircraft? Right. And we're in even more importantly, you know, what's going on? Why would they be playing this game where the, you know, it's a like, uh, they know that it's discredit. They know that the public knows it's not true. And yet it's enough that the public doesn't care because they're more worried about paying rent. Right. They're basically distracted. They're getting beat down. That's that the is line. the key word, distraction. Mm -hmm. And so Ebola is typical. You know, you get a big fear thing going on. I, my girlfriend went in for a mammogram. And, uh, you know, uh, an annual mammogram. And on the questionnaires where they're, you know, new doctor, the, one of the first things, have you been to Africa? Have you been exposed to Ebola? What? Agreed. Why are they asking in Grants Pass, Oregon, those kinds of questions? <laughs> well, yeah. this, is the, this is exactly what the whole thing is about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the distraction of fear. And, I agree. Uh, I totally agree. It's a psychological game. Any way you look at it, it's all about mind control, mass, mass, mass mind control, if you ask me. And guess what else? It's working. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Well, CIA yeah. put it, mind control. No, we don't We don't need mind control. We've got TV. Well, yeah, now everything's that being transmitted. That is an actual quote from the CIA. Yeah, the well, way. the CIA is notorious for mind control. You know that. I mean, I know you were married so to the CIA in agent, were you? in response to your <laughs> question about Judy Wood, right. I'm impressed with her work. I think that she has merit. Um, her references to John Hutchinson and the Hutchinson effect is a reflection of the fact that nobody really understands yet what technology was involved. I'm not sure it's mine. Mine would work. Uh, mine doesn't show up as a patent until 2008, which is different than 2001. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, but Mossad had a neutron bomb, which later became the fullerene fusion bomb. The buckyball is the only structure in nature that is strong enough to withstand and contain that fusion reaction. It's uh, about 100 times stronger than diamond as a carbon structure. Mm -hmm. And when you form nanotubes, those nanotubes are going to be how they make our space elevator to the space platform, which is now being made right now. Mm -hmm. What about the SDI particle beam weapon? What about that? I think this is a, di a distraction of particles. A particle beam weapon would be like a rail gun uh, sending out bullets of electromagnetic pulses. Mm -hmm. okay. That's your particle thing. And Lockheed pro has just come out with their teleportation cold fusion device at Lockheed mm -hmm. with the National Ignition Facility in Livermore. And guess what? It's a normal laser 
that they bend time space so they move the beam from one point to another and possibly that's the ignition switch or ignition system that might have been deployed to activate a fullerene. Well, it sounds like a death ray to me. Well, no, it's just a normal, it, what the, it's not a death, okay. Like the Tesla death know, ray? Go ahead. Yeah, I don't know those things. What I do know is the physics I know, there is patents now on a neutron fullerene bomb. Mm-hmm. And uh, that patent is, uh, I've got, I'll give it, I'll give you a picture of it for your website if you want. The thing is, it's out of Carlsbad, California. The idea of being able to take a structure like that and place what water does when it comes up to touch a surface of anything is that it forms exclusion zone. And it's different for any structure it touches. That's the memory part of what makes water so interesting. And to put it inside a three-dimensional structure so that it is restructuring the molecule itself from all dimensions and then activated with a laser beam that pops into the center of the of the of the little buckyball and gets reflected off these surfaces where the center then goes into fusion reaction Mm -hmm. and that's precision on that is 1.24 nanometers. That's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Truly. I mean, the precision of it. Now, imagine if they have, through geoengineering, managed to place that in every single human being. What does it do to the DNA? I don't know that it will. It's an inert thing, mm-hmm. uh, like activated charcoal. Uh, we, But to have nano technology inside our body from the air we breathe and then to have that used as a weapon yep kind of creepy well they weaponize the skies with the chemtrails obviously so obviously anything that gets saturated well, with this is they be- have done this yet solaris but i'll tell you this if they haven't they will oh, yeah. and nasa says so in their document well, I think that's the whole agenda. I think this has been, this isn't something they just dreamed up overnight. I mean, I'm certain that this has been going on and this was planned for a very long time, very long time. And there is a question here again in chat. It's from Eightfold. He says, can you please ask me about Norman, excuse me, Norman Bergram and the Ringmakers of Saturn. He was an inventor on the original Polaris mission program and has a book full of so-called photos of vehicles around the rings of Saturn. <laughs> well, you have a more informed audience than They I are am. good. You guys are rocking it. Uh, I don't know anything about that. I wouldn't doubt it because, of course, EO was prominent in Arthur C. Clarke's books of uh, 2010. And all these planets are yours except EO. And they turned that one into a binary star. Look at the metaphor of Nibiru and all of it in all of the science fiction writing. The mythology of it runs through like a thread. I don't have a clue what's going on on the rings of Saturn. I have seen shadows where they talked about Nibiru being out in that area. And they have pictures. I've seen it on some of the things. I don't know about the disinformation part of that or the distraction of it. Right. What, what year I was that? Know, Richard, when they saw supposedly the the other one, Nibiru. Well, over by Mercury when it became uncloaked. Okay, so but what year do you think that was? I mean, how many that years was ago? 2011. Okay. NASA uh, had that on the news just about the same time Fukushima happened, and then there was no. Everybody was more concerned about Fukushima and its immediacy, and that cloaking of of that of that craft out ne- next to Mex- uh, Mercury, and then it started moving like an asteroid or something, and it would move toward the sun, went right into the heliosphere. Mm-hmm. Now, there's only one thing that can do that, and that's called a book, science fiction book, called Sun Diver, and it's about a Dyson sphere where you line your your surroundings in a circular gold, mono monoatomic gold, and you reflect back those kinds of plasma heat so that you have an environment 
that is being protected from hard radiation. Mm -hmm. The only other thing that could be happening also is a type of cavitation where the so-called hollow earth is not actually the earth, but a topological surface where the inside becomes the outside. Mm -hmm. That may be something else that's going on in terms of double ganger and the idea of an alternate earth. Mm-hmm. I don't understand any of this. I am speculating because I, you know, I love science fiction and read it, but I also have to do Occam's razor. Most logical is the most probable and the physics involved. Now we are understanding how cavitation works. And now there is a whole new physics called super cavitation. Look it up. It's interesting where that's going to take you. It's different than cavitation, and it has to do with Euler's equations. And I have to see, say, fluid dynamics, that there is something else going on if we look at our universe as a fluid. And with that, that's the so-called, um, what is that, uh, uh, Wilhelm Reich and some of the others that talked about orgone. Right. Yes. Yep. Uh, that idea that the fluid dynamic relationships of one atom to another. Well, what do you think about Basically. the oceans arriving on the Earth as an alien intelligence? No, I, the oceans so? are, uh, in one of my papers, I actually show that the, uh, the fullering neutron bomb with exclusion zone water, you know, using deuterium, is precisely what we see in the, in a, in the movement of a wave. Mm-hmm. It says the, the process is right there in front of us, and it, it, we're just only now having the conceptuals to be able to see it as one thing over another. I don't know what it all means yet. It's all interesting. And I'm in discovery like you are. Oh, it's fascinating. I'm telling you, Richard, it's so fun to have you on the show because yeah, I mean, this, this information is awesome. Well, it's not information. It's speculation. Well, I don't think it's it's speculation at all. I mean, I know you elaborate on a few things, but seriously, I mean, there's data out there. There's hard data out there. We're just trying to decipher a lot of things. Well, then that's the other part of what they call counterintelligence, lying by omission. I can't stand that. But they don't give you the whole truth. And as a result, off you go in a tangent. Right. Because that's where the data is leading you. Yeah. Something to chew on. I can't stand that. Yeah, well, that's called a distraction. I know, but it's irritating to me because I'm very black and white, (laughs) cut and dry. You know, I don't like that BS. So um, it's just wasteful. You know, if you ask me, we'd be be doing so much more on this planet if people would stop the lying and the exaggeration. And yet they do it in the name of national security or a clearance of some kind. But still, you know. Well, you know, I I went back and watched Harrison Ford and uh, alien uh, cowboys and aliens, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they're collecting the gold. (laughs) <laughs> Isn't it interesting? If you want to know what's going to happen, watch Hollywood. <laughs> I try not. Well, I, I have to tell you, Interstellar was a breakthrough for me. They actually it, yeah. nailed a visual of what five space might be like in the so-called Akashic Records. And that movie, toward the end of the movie, when he is, goes through that black hole, and as uh, now in a library trying to communicate to his daughter in the past. It's interesting. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I didn't see it. So, but you know, when you, you look at black seen holes, interstellar you know yet? What? I don't even go ah! to the movies anymore. I must say, Richard, I haven't been to the movies in so long. I mean, of course, yeah. that one's worth going to see. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, McConaughey's a hunk anyway, but I'm not uh, on those. <laughs> or but, I still get but, played into that. I just it's yeah. actually the physics of it. Linda well, that's Mal- okay if it's something that's enter- you know intelligent. Then and usually it's written by a science fiction or you know author, right? Yeah. Well, Linda Moulton Howe even did a really nice analysis of that with uh, uh, Michael Hampton mm-hmm. out of Hong Kong, and and it's interesting. I don't know what it all means yet. Well, I guess I'll look at it and decode it then. You know, but chakras, let's let's talk about chakras for a second here. Chakras are portals and gateways and dimensional gateways. So you're talking about going through a, a navigating through a black hole just since whatever this movie was about. But literally, uh, we are that navigational device. I mean, the body, and you know it, we're multidimensional in design. And we're capable of doing many, many things basically activated through frequency. So, well, the enteric nervous system, your gut, is your first brain. 
And that brain is outside space and time. Mm-hmm. Right. That's There's no such thing as space and time. I mean, it's generated by mankind. Time is a benchmark of measure. You know that. Well, time is a duration of consciousness. Robert Ornstein, it is the way you store memory. I must and not have any memory then because I use, I use time as a benchmark of measure and I navigate through consciousness without time. Well, space and time are the, you know, length, breadth, and width, and time are how we make measurements in physics. But that's a quantum universe, which is uh, one plane. Right. And there are, okay, then there are, in a holographic universe, instead of talking about space and time, we start talking about information and resolution of information. It's a different way of looking at the universe, where everything is simply connected, and really the level of analysis, with microcosm, macrocosm, a uh, human being, like when you look at a body, a human body, it's less than 10% human. It's mostly bacteria, viruses, and molds, and so with water transport processes, which means you are a habitat. And so that's one of the early things I started saying. You are no longer what you eat. You are whom you feed. And each of us is different and unique, like a, our own unique galaxy. And I'm guessing that's the so-called rays of light that they're talking about in terms of what resonant galaxy you simulate on a microcosmic scale. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there, it's like a habitat. You have, there's a woman up in British Columbia. She is uh, in um, natural, natural forest. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, she's in forestry. And she talks about the mother tree, just like an avatar, where there is a central tree in a forest that sets up a network with Michael Razia to warn the neighborhood of forest fires, winds, whatever. And it's called Michael Razia. And you have your habitat with viruses and uh, Michael, my, 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 mycelium, uh, bugs, you know, different kinds of bugs, thrip, nematodes, whatever. And they form this aggregate of a habitat. And if you look at a human being, we are very much like a, a galaxy with our habitat of certain kinds of things going on. And each of us is different and why health is different for each of us. Mm-hmm. Just because someone is more sickly, their balance is in that regard. It's, um, it's interesting how that plays into the new directions of imaginal psychology and how they now would see illness as a way that the higher self or what you would call your, 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 uh, you know, the other nine tenths of your cerebral cortex, that part uh, is communicating to your consciousness. And that once you get the message, there's no need for the illness. All cancer is a direct result of being angry. Well, it's frequency based too. I mean, all illness is based on a frequency. I mean, it can be cured. And I know people don't like to use that word cure, but it can be cured through frequency. Everything is deployed through frequency. We have, we have a frequency war here and, and that affects our emotional body, our mental body, our physical body. So if it's not in alignment, of course, there's going to be illness. There's going to be disease causing factors. So, you know, I, I can see that. And diet, of course, and now we have the GMOs to contaminate further. Um, I didn't want to change the subject here, but I did have another question for you over there. I saw that. (laughs) I don't know how to respond to the journey to Jupiter uh, from the movie 2001. Actually, uh, when Kubrick actually put that movie together, that was possibly the single most effort attempt to bring science into uh, visuals, where you, you actually got a sense of what a monolith was, and in the rings of Saturn. Uh, that's where it was. And, of course, the Jupiter is where EO and all the right. rest of those. You know what? Um, let me read that question real quick to the to the listeners here from, from Eightfold. It was, what about does, or what does he think about the journey to Jupiter in the movie 2001? Was it really a journey to Saturn? And, you know, I believe, I don't know if it was in the book or not, but wasn't it a true that, that um, it was actually supposed to be Saturn? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, I don't know that offhand, but I thought. But EO. Was a was around 
of uh, Jupiter, and that was the planet that was going to then be converted into a binary sun. Mm. That's uh, Robert Heinlein. <laughs> yeah, some great sci-fi writers, I'll tell you what. Well, that's visionaries. Uh, mm -hmm. All your best ones, Richard Forward, uh, Bayer, all of them have exceptional backgrounds in science. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, there was one called the Neutron Star. The, uh, it, was a it was called Neutron Star. And it was about a neutron star where a life form begins to evolve in consciousness with magnetic fields being so strong you only had two-dimensional growth movement. Now, that was an interesting physics description where they watched this uh, spaceship from Earth come to visit their neutron star, and as he evolved so quickly, he is, while the, while the ship is visiting his neutron star, they go back to Earth and fix the three black holes that are inside the sun and save the Earth. It's an interesting book. That was called Neutron Star. And right. uh, there's, you know, when you find good science fiction writing like that, where they, it's, it's not space opera like Star Wars. It's more like teaching principles or concepts. Mm -hmm. I can tell you the movie of the century is going to be Prometheus 2. When the woman in that Prometheus movie takes the mothership back to the home world, of the engineers and Rex Havoc. I read the comic. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's a great Dark Horse Press, man. Comics are worth <laughs> I love comics. I'm big yeah, on Yeah, well, Dark Horse Press and Alien vs. Predator, there's cool. 42 in the series. Yeah, and I like so that. You've only seen a couple of them in movies. Yeah, see, that's what I mean. It, all of these movies in Hollywood, I mean, they're getting their data from really good writers and really good uh, people out well, there. Well, different. Yeah, breakthroughs like there was in the 60s with music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you really can't give Hollywood, quote unquote, the credit. It's actually the writers, the sci-fi writers. I mean, look at Total Recall. Look at all these old movies that they did. I mean, they're fantastic. Yeah, and iRobot with yeah. Will Smith, you know, redone. Mm -hmm. I understand, yes, I understand. That's it... uh, Isaac Asimov and, and some of the other writers like that. The My favorite writer is, uh, I like Orson Scott Card, but I also like uh, Alan Dean Foster. Hmm. Into the out of. Ah, that's a good book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love the title. He wrote one like called Maori. He wrote another one called Star Wars. Oh yeah, that's Alan. Alan Dean Foster has wrote some of the Star Wars episodes. There's a whole bunch of those. Mm -hmm. Well, you know they have to have had pierce the veil somewhere along their path of the truth of what's really going on behind this matrix. Well, then that's the time travel part where you're talking to yourself from future in the past. Right, and that's all consciousness oriented. Well, then that's what Interstellar was about when he found himself in the library, which is the Akashic Records, and he starts pushing books out as a way to communicate to his daughter using cipher. Hmm, cool. See, that I haven't was seen an interesting it, so. concept. Yeah, it sounds all right. Well, I guess I'm behind in my movies, but, you know, one of these centuries well, I'll get back on it. you're behind, you know, priorities. I'm going to suggest that one's worth watching. <laughs> okay. Well, it, it was uh, scientifically, it was in 2001, but whoever did put that together, there was a serious attempt to be mindful of physics right. and the way it would work. And actually, the way interstellar works is that there's a wormhole up near Saturn. And that's what they do is they go to another star system using a wormhole that exists out near Saturn. Not it's in Saturn, in but outside Saturn? Yeah, it's outside Saturn. Well, yeah, know, it's, it's next to Saturn. Do you think it's actually, It's. I don't think it's impossible that these planets actually do have gateways and portals and dimensional portals through their own planet. Like you can go through the planet itself and go to well, a new universe. Now, 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 here we go. This is leading <laughs> into a whole new realm here. There is, hey. a, there is a physics called cosmobiology. It came out of Yugoslavia in the 70s with Rejic and... Uh, there were they one guy wrote a book called The Lunar Sex Cycle of the Female, where he absolutely proves that you ovulate based on the moment that you're born. There is a biological clock that's set in the position of the sun, the moon, and earth. And one of the projects I did for the military was the planet Neptune. And there are no known laws that can affect 
that, that Neptune would in any way affect the Earth, except that when Neptune and the Earth and the Sun were in a specific geometric alignment, there was a major earthquake with a three sigma error coefficient. That means that when that alignment occurred, there was a 99.99975% probability of that event happening. And Dr. Wilbur Franklin, who was at Kent State at that time, did the study on catfish where their skin resistance using GSR changed eight hours like an early warning sensor before the earthquake would happen. Hmm, that's fascinating. Yeah, but that was called cosmobiology. Look it up. There are books out on that subject to be distinguished differently than our current forms of astrology. Yeah, like I love the way you remember all this, Richard. You have a fascinating memory. I'm lucky. <laughs> you are really good, I swear. Um, there's another question here. Let's see. Thank you, Jerry B. This is, I guess it's from Fold again. Can you also please ask Dr. Miller if he has ever, he has ever heard of Gabriel Cron or the idea of the negative resistor? No, I haven't. Is that, ask him back, is that somehow related to magnetic monopoles? Um, is he still in chat? I don't know if he's in there or not. Um, but that, I, I, I'll check that out. I will okay. do some research. I'll try to get an answer for you. And okay. send back yeah. As That's a courtesy, but um, I am aware of magnetic monopoles. Boeing has a magnetic monopole now. And you need to know how this works because this is how you create wormholes. What you do is you take two magnets, and if you put them together, they'll clunk together and stick together. Okay, so you pull them apart, and you turn one magnet 180 degrees, and then you try to push them back together again. They won't. They push against each other. So then what you do is you put a screw in the side of one of these magnets, and then you put a threading on the other one, and you screw the two together. And as they come closer and closer together, they bend space. Space can be seen in drum physics as a circular drum. It has to be circular. There's a reason. It has to do with vessel functions. And you put a latex glove over the top of it so it's a stretchy kind of space that's what space is it bends and gives and what you do is you put a large heavy baseball in the center of it that's how space is distorted by mass creating the concept of gravity right and the reason the marble then doesn't fall straight in but goes around in a circle is because of coriolis forces and other kinds of movements mm -hmm. relating one system to another. Right. And so if a magnetic monopole, basically, this is how the principles of teleportation, what it does is it bends space-time so that it's like a cavitation process where anything inside that object is in, in the field is uh, not subject to gravity. Okay, let me and ask that you something. Means you can go from zero to Mach 60 instantaneously without any kind of damage because of gravity. Mm -hmm. It's right, inertialess. Well, right. And so, so uh, that, go ahead. That's why you see these spacecraft, if you will, that seem to jerk. They don't move smoothly. If you actually have a close encounter, and I have, and many have, when you watch the object, it doesn't actually move smoothly. It's like in little jerks, like it's moving from one set of spaces to another. And that is called teleportation. Now, the hmm. interesting part of teleportation is that the big question exists. Is it you moving through space or is it a copy of you being replicated in the other space? Interesting. And that's where the concept of multiple universes comes in. And so is it a copy of you that has been teleported? And actually the experiments with the Bose, uh, Higgs, Higgs uh, boson and other studies that they're doing now are starting to show that the so-called grandfather effect of time travel is not valid, i.e. you can have several grandfathers. Mm -hmm. that are copies of each other. Just like in the movie 
the one with Jet Li. Right. Well, we are multidimensional beings, and I think that that needs to be correlated. That needs to be you know, calculated in, because at, with multidimensional design work, we are capable of navigating simultaneously in other universes and star well, systems. Well, that's right. In fact, your enteric nervous system, your gut, has neurotransmitters mm-hmm. that are somehow redirecting everything. Your upper brain is not your mind. That basically is there to make all your beliefs true. Mm-hmm. And that's what it does. And if it's it's reality. Like, well, it's a hologram. I mean, the, the entire planet, you okay, can call so it a big ass. now we're talking hologram. about internal landscape and the way you structure water. And the fact is that this is where it becomes extremely important to be mindful of your thoughts. That's what meditation was all about in the first place, that you don't allow yourself to wander, but that you keep your focus on not being distracted, and you then can find purpose. Right. Well, that's why there's mind control, because they don't want people focused in higher consciousness. Once again, we'll get back to that point. Anyway, good luck with that, because all of you, to some limited extent, are getting what I'm saying. And actually, this is really important. At some level of that hologram that you talk about, it's only four up, not all eight scales. Four up is called the collective unconscious. And that place is where you are me, and I am you, and I am the walrus, cuckoo ca I know you say And that <laughs> means that the war for Earth is I'm battlefield Earth inside me, and that if I can do it, it's happening for mankind. And that's what Rudolf Steiner meant when he said we are no longer at war in the physical world, that if we wish to change the world, we simply change ourselves, and the world changes with us. Yeah, and in true. imaginal psychology, they would suggest that none of this is real, that the only thing that's real is you, and that you, I am the wise old man part of you having dialogue with your consciousness. Well, it's energy and consciousness in motion, the way I see life and the way I see this matrix. And you can call it mass, you can call it whatever you want, but it's still energy when when push comes to shove. Now, you were talking about that magnetic monopole, and of course, um, to me, it sounds like when you were talking about bending space, you're creating gravity waves? That's part, that's what a gravity wave, that was Washington State University out of Houston, Texas, mm-hmm. managed by MIT and Caltech. Yes, okay. gravity okay. wave generator, yeah. just wanted to confirm that. That's where, that started back in the 70s, it led to some weird movies like The Fog. Oh, um, I remember that, that was cheap. Yeah, imagine But that. it was good, it was all right. Yeah, well, that was one movie you did go to. You wouldn't really want to see it. <laughs> no, I think I saw it on regular television, actually. Yeah, yeah. It always comes down to <laughs> TV, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, you know, I don't have a TV a anymore. Monster. That was when I was younger. What's that? Trust me, yeah. I don't You're own a television. I have a computer now. That's my window to the world. <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, here is the first rule of machines. They're alien-based life forms, and they're hostile. Never let them know you're in a hurry. Uh, good one. That's the first rule. Of well, you know, we're machines too. We have supercomputer brains and minds and all that good stuff. So, well, there's things going on, <laughs> and um, actually, with the current enjoyment of electromagnetic radiation that's happening on Earth, um, you're going to see a lot more weird anomalies. Not just alien abductions and what is the other one? Oh yeah, targeted individuals. It's going to be across the board, and more and more people are going to have schisms or breaks in their reality that are not assimilable. Well, it's almost and like I dimensions should... are colliding. Wouldn't you say there's a rip in the, in the fabric and a tear in the fabric of the beyond the space-time continuum? Well, now you're talking about the Chanty project. Okay. And that's this big super collider in Africa that made contact with a, another dimension. That is called the Chanty, C-H-A-N-T-I, Chanty project. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's an actual thing that has happened. We don't know what to make of the whole thing. Basically, there are two universes that are colliding with each other, and some people are able to see the the schisms of one universe over another. And that would be your Chuacabra, your Skinwalker Ranch, mm-hmm. and some of this other kind of phenomena that we don't really have any way Ooh, okay. of fitting. So it's like an overlay because there's a parallel bleed-through effect between... That is correct. Okay. And that some people arbitrarily have that schism, archetypal encounter, that is out of the norm, and they have no way to process it. And right. it's happening more and more with more of us, and that is your quickening. Well, I think that's DNA activation. You know, it's like taking acid and not being prepared for the trip. I mean, would you say? 
in an analogy? You know, I have a little rap on acid people don't seem to under. I took LSD with Timothy Leary back in 1964 when it was still legal. Yeah. And let me tell you, LSD, like sergic acid diethylamide, is a toxin. And usually, like most toxins, when you take it, it's broken down into the salts and in the urine probably within 20 minutes. And the other 20 hours of response, hallucinations, is the release of your own natural form of lysergic acid amide that is, starts the brain production of that. You, we all have it. We all do it at different levels of being able to do what we do. And taking these drugs that will often jumpstart the real production of those neurotransmitters. It isn't LSD. LSD is a toxin. It is your body's response that overcompensates, that floods the brain with LSD, lysergic acid amide. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, these different neurotransmitters do different things in the brain. And lysergic acid amide is the one associated with aha, when you connect one dot with another. Dimethyltryptamine is the one where Rick Strassman says creates the concept of God, something that is beyond you. Gives you that's what DMT is about, and the so-called pineal gland with Kundalini. And with that, there are, uh, we're just now understanding the roles of harmony in these different neurotransmitters. And I remember a metaphor once said about this one group of aliens that were studying man because they could not understand how man could exist as a life form when the difference between being normal and psychotic could be measured in micrograms. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing, 10 to, the, 10 to the minus 6. That's a very small amount of chemistry. And to find that kind of chemistry, that unique neurotransmitter in the most commonest of plants like crabgrass would suggest that chemistry is not necessarily what we think it is. It's basically a delivery system from God. Right. And it's also about frequency once again, because, um, you know, if you go back to alchemy, you know, alchemy is nothing without a certain frequency encoded in, if you ask me. It was a relationship. That's one of my books, The Modern Alchemist. It mm -hmm. is a relationship of yourself to your higher self. And each of us are different in the way we form those dialogues. I cannot stress the importance of keeping a diary. Mm -hmm. Just like training the mind is essential. Because the thoughts you choose to entertain, that is, you have a responsibility for that. Because the thoughts you choose to entertain happen. That is, you are creating reality with your thoughts and imagination. And so if you want to go creepy, guess where it's going to go? <laughs> that's why you don't watch creepy movies. Well, or that's why you don't. <laughs> I love them, but, you know, I love them. Well, and you have to much. clear it out of your uh, psyche yeah, after yeah. a while there. Let oh, me ask you. But, oh, I'm sorry, Richard. Go ahead. No, no, that's fine. I was just thinking. I just wanted to ask that. you something. Before we were talking off air, and you mentioned something about 2019 being one of the dates, one of the significant dates for the pole shift. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? I think that the uh, whole of our society is going to come unraveled around 2019. I think that's when gold and the Anunnaki and all the rest of this stuff is going to come into forefront. And that by 2020, it's going to be down and dirty, and there are only going to be a few people that can actually survive. That means you need to get off the grid to some extent and semi-sovereign with yourself before that date. That's the drop-dead date. If you don't have your water and your infrastructure together by 2019, likely is you will be a great candidate for FEMA. Well, you know what's interesting to me is you don't see anybody, um, you don't see certain breakaway societies being able to bilocate or perhaps phase shift into another alternative Earth. Well, yeah. that's shamanism, bilocation, and the idea of transference. That's again what the Avatar program is about. I guess that's where I'm heading then. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've Sorry. got a chip for you, baby. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm loaded. Here, Let me tell you. eat me and say, here, that's the red pill or the blue pill? I think I already I ate the red pill. I took both of them and turned purple. Yay, that's great. <laughs> Congratulations. 
<laughs> Which is, by the way, just for the record, a royal color. It you is. Know, Crown chakra. Red and blue and you spin them. What happens next is the way your eyes gate it will see purple. Nice. <laughs> You're so Another cool. metaphor. You be know, you mindful. laugh like the guy, the, the great Oz in The Wizard of Oz. Well, that's why. They, is that uh, who you are? Such a wonderful wiz he is. <laughs> but I wasn't fuzzy, was I? Oh, I hope not. No, no. That was fuzzy, was he? Okay. I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I like to do a little anagrams in your brain because I know how the brain processes. That's neurolinguistics. Well, and I play with words sometimes to cause you to watch your eyes glaze over. That's called pig lipping. And then I slip a little command in. That, <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate that. I'll sleep well tonight. Oh, it's all fun. I know. Yeah. I know what you're up to. You don't get past me very much, Richard. I'm uh, a grumpy old man. No, you're not. You're wonderful. Hey, listen, you know, we're getting ready to wrap this up pretty soon. We've got about 10 minutes left, but I want everybody to be able to access you and, and actually purchase your books and your articles, whatever you have available. So let's give them a rundown of all of your websites. Well, my primary website is richardallenmiller.com, A-L-A-N. And from there, you can buy my books. That is how I live. Uh, it's my only source of income, so feel free about Christmas. I don't want donations, but I'd love to sell you some of my books. And if you write to me, I'll give you a bunch of free articles to motivate you into wanting to read more of my works. And here's the good news. I did four books last year. And I have 10 ready for press this year, and they're all follow-ons on previous titles, including Power Tools for the 21st Century had a workbook one. There are two new workbooks that join with that. And then the third book in the series is called The Non-Local Mind in a Holographic Universe. That's ready for press. Now, yeah. How to change the movie. That's excellent. People really need to take advantage of you while you're here on this timeline. You know, I, I mentioned to you before about doing a webinar of some kind. I think you would be awesome at that. I, I, maybe we can talk about that sometime and see if you I can do a personal that, I just don't. What I do now, my joy, is to actually see projects I started 40 years ago, books I conceived 40 years ago, actually having closure now. Mm -hmm. And I have got a single major book for every year I've been out of graduate school. And with that, there's at least six follow on articles. So I've been out of graduate school now more than 45 years. I've You're just a baby. A lot of books on magic, agriculture. You can't make it in one field, so I thought I'd become three writers. Excellent. <laughs> Just well, kidding. You, well, you're a multidimensional being, so there's that's an unlimited. Well, they action. call me a, a polymath. I, that me a polymath is uh, is a term used for someone like um, oh I don't know. Uh, I have skills, world class skills in several fields that are unrelated, but in fact are not at this moment in time. Survival is going to be about farming, and I am. Uh, Educational reform with a paradigm shift in agriculture. That's what I'm. That's why they call me the postman. And I think that's a good thing that you're doing with the agriculture too, by the way. And I, I um, I suspect you're going to be staying where you're at right now on the map, right? Well, I don't know. Yeah, I ha I've been forced to move. I'm going to move down the street. My entire life is in boxes right now. It's really awful. Mm. So feel free to buy books because I'm going to need it for the move. Right. Yeah. Hey. Please, please support uh, Dr. Miller's work. I really. Well, it's uh, just uh, if the books resonate. Well, they will. I mean, the thing is about you, Richard. More, you yeah. Know. I mean, you're brilliant. You're a brilliant man. And you have a lot of data and a lot in your head that you've put into books and articles that I think people should really start reading and paying attention to. And you were ahead of your time in the illusion of time anyway. I mean, a lot of what you were talking about. Well, that's I mean, because I've got a TARDIS. <laughs> is that right? That makes sense. I'm ahead of my time because I haven't even been born yet. Ah, Actually, well, I'm not coming back here, so huh? I'm not coming back to this planet. <laughs> yeah, time travel is uh, one of the things I'm going to be writing more about because all of us are actually time travelers from the future, and oh, yeah. none of us get it yet. But I get you it. You will as you pick up your memory. Oh, believe me, I get it. I get it big time. But um, let me see. Are you doing a biography on yourself? I've asked you this before. <laughs> Um, this guy from Veterans Today has written a brief article on that. I have, that's something that could happen. Dr. Stanley Krippner, my mentor, has offered me next year to graduate students to do their master's on, by writing my autobiography. You know, 
Yeah. Ghost Rider. That's a good movie to watch. That was Ghost a good movie. Rider. I like that one. I did see that. Yeah. No, yeah. well, you should do your biography because you have so much data in there, and I think people would be interested in knowing more about you on, on so many different levels. So, you know, we didn't get through half the questions I had in mind tonight. So, of course, obviously, you're always a regular here, your family. So I um, want you to come back when you get Thank a chance. Thank you. I always like you, Solaris. Oh, I love you. Richard, you're wonderful. You're a class act, baby. Oh, thank <laughs> and you. I love your new hair look. I oh, love it. You like my really hair? Good. Don't sh- yeah, no, I, I changed it. Yeah, I'm a little uh, different. You need a blue spike for attitude. Like that. <laughs> I need no, a- no, dark, bright, bright blue. It'll look great on you. Oh, thanks. Me. I'll tell my hairdresser you told him. Something right out of like, Cyber City. Well, it's kind of like you. cyber right now, but yeah, it kind of suits me in my avatar design for the, for the season, I guess is the word. Well, but I do want to thank you for being here tonight. It's been such an honor and a pleasure to have you always. You're so informative and brilliant, and it's such a pleasure to have your presence here with us tonight. I know everybody appreciated you in chat, and thanks for those great questions in chat, by the way. Thank yeah, you for I'm going to check everybody. out this one question. Yeah, you guys are awesome. And, and just uh, just email Dr. Richard Allen Miller. And once again, what's that email address? I'm uh, Rick at nwbotanicals.org. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. And, and That's also, one of my other websites is nwbotanicals.org. That's uh, one that I haven't done anything in now since I've come returned from physics. But there's a whole bunch of articles, including magic and alternative physics, on that website if you go to Oak. Excellent. And also, everybody, stay tuned for Shiny Side Out with David Dunger and Mickey coming up next to sail you on into the night from down under. And, of course, they're going to be talking about time travel. Can you believe that? Talk about synchronicity, right? Yes. That's time travel is next on everybody's agenda. Well, I think if I think it's good to time travel that way we can leave this timeline and kind of go someplace else. What do you think? Stay tuned. Same bat channel. Same bat well, channel. Well, I'm going to send a bat signal out, okay? <laughs> there you go, man. <laughs> yeah. I'll get the SWAT team at my house. <laughs> Will Batman save Robin? Will Robin be able to da 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 da? Stay tuned. Same bat channel. Same that bat channel. That was great. The old the old days with the original Batman and Robin, right? I love it all. It's comic good. book time for me. So do you have a lot of comic books? I do. I have a very large collection that I started in the 50s. Nice. Excellent. And really, Dark Horse Press has outdone itself in the Alien vs. Predator series. And they have a bunch of different spinoffs like they did with Sarah Connor and, you know, John Connor and, the you know, the... The Terminator series. Right. But you know they it, have a new movie out coming out with... Uh, I know, I know. What do you I think? Know. Yeah, well, it's all good. And like I said, Hollywood, if she could. Well, you know, all of that cybernetic stuff, we all know it exists anyway. So that's the bottom line. You know, the question I have to you is, and it's probably going to run out of time here, but with the CERN, you know, simulating black hole technology, I know we have capabilities to do this. What's your impression of that? We already are doing that. Exactly. That's what I'm wondering. That that is what CERN is doing. That is, yeah. Is that creating any anomalies on the planet? That's my question to you. Well, I don't know. I think it is. Well, I don't know. I know. I, I don't know, know I either, but my sensors are telling concern. me that I think it's doing something. So I was just curious yeah, what your impression was. I don't know. What about the magnetic? So we're talking about the polar shift. Now, if they're using some CERN over there, they're doing some kind of uh, experimentation. Can they stabilize that? You know, that was the whole idea of the God particle in in uh, the, that movie that Tom Hanks made. Mm-hmm. I um, I have concern with when we're working with these kinds of, of uh, laws in physics and think that that's one of the reasons why I have some of these other planets away from Earth where we can do some experimenting. Actually, we are tinkering with life support right now, and there is no owner's manual. Mm-hmm. And so here we are messing around, and Fukushima could have become an extinction event. The stratosphere... If you look at Japan right now, it's lit up like a Roman candle. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to the NETC.com website, the Nuclear Emergency Tracking Center, look at Japan. It's creepy. Well, the thing is, and they're all silent about it. That's what I can't stand. You know, well, that's the gag order where it's against the law. Well, that's just ridiculous because we're dealing with a global situation here. There should be no censorship whatsoever. Well, that's your that's your Yakuza and the absolute no accountability. And no oversight. Yeah, but there is accountability. That's the problem. Well, they do the same thing in any other country. I mean, there's always a censorship and there's a blackout when it comes to data. So, but yeah, I mean, I suspect a lot of the things that are happening with our oceans right now. I think that everybody 
should realize that nuclear energy is over and that we need to turn the switch off. I agree. Yeah. But now they want to put more emphasis on the grid. So um, everything's going to be electrical now. With that. Yeah. Well, Texas will be the first to revolt. Trust mm-hmm. me. And they have their own grid. Yeah. And so there it is. And right. what you need to do is figure a way to become less dependent on the grid. Like, for example, if you didn't have any power, how are you going to get your water out of the ground? Mm-hmm. Right. You need a plan. Absolutely. Now, do you well, have an owner's manual for that? Start. Have you What's come that? up with? Do you, have you started doing any type of uh, manual for people to try to uh, have like a no, priority? No, but Matt Stein for? and I do these urban survival skill workshops, okay. two-day workshops, and, and we're going to do one of those with Judy Wood in Lebanon, Missouri, at the end of March. Sweet. Well, if you that's if, it, USA prepares.com with Vincent Finelli. You know, if she's with you and you both want to get on the show at the same time, let me know and I'll try to get you both on. Well, I'll call Matt and uh, without, you know, w- that would be a show of shows. Yeah. Especially if you got Lou Wesley, Wesley Rawls and a couple of others on a round table. Let me, let's see if we can't do that for the show. Get a, I'm, a, on here. I'm available. If you can put something like that together, I'd be happy to be part oh, of that. I think because that would be great because between all and of you. And that's just down the street in Truckee, California. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know where Lou Wesley Rawls is, but they're all of us are going to be in one place in Lebanon, Missouri at the end of March. Excellent. Well, we're out of time here. It's been a pleasure, Richard. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah.